Hi, welcome to the Swamp School. My name is Lori and I'm one of the instructors with the Swamp School. Our primary concern at our school is wetlands. In particular, delineating or defining the boundaries of wetlands so we don't drain and destroy them. Why would we drain and destroy wetlands? Well, builders want to build, people want builders to build, and build we do. Populations are growing at an exponential rate. Although this may be true, let's talk about our subject today. There are three parts to a wetland, the hydrology, of course, or the water, the soil, and the vegetation, or the plants. But today I want to talk about one of my favorite parts of learning about wetlands. That is plant adaptations. Plants have adapted in some awesome ways so they can live in an environment without oxygen in the soil, sometimes flooded, sometimes unusually dry. You could say that these plants were made for a wetland. Anyway, let's get started learning and see why these types of plants are so interesting. First of all, let's discuss what wetland plants are called. They are called hydrophytes, meaning water plants. These water plants are adapted to living in soil that is either permanently or periodically flooded by shallow or sometimes high water or more like, likely they're planted in soil that is saturated with water. Have you ever overwatered a house plant? It dies, right? Well, a wetland plant is in an environment that is saturated with water, so any dissolved oxygen is depleted by microbes in the soil that consume it. This leaves nothing for the plants to use for respiration. These plants have ways of getting oxygen to their tissues that is required for respiration in plants. Remember, respiration is when stored energy is released to supply energy for plant life. We're just going to talk about the structural adaptations of hydrophytes for this presentation. The first strategy for wetland plants to get oxygen to their tissues is called arrhythmia. It is when roots and stems develop large holes in the tissue. This strategy makes for very porous plant tissue. For example, a typical plant has a porosity of maybe 2 to 7% of their tissue, while a wetland plant can have much more. A typical wetland plant can have 60% porosity in their stems and root systems. This accommodates the oxygen needed for respiration. The next strategy for wetlands is to have adventitious roots. These are the roots that are not underground, but normally would be, of course. There are different variations of this strategy that we'll cover here. The first type of adventitious root is called prop roots, and they're usually found mostly on trees with slender trunks. They're also found on mangrove trees. These are roots that extend from the stem and continue to develop higher up as the tree grows taller. You can see this in the picture. The next strategy is air roots or pneumatophores. You can see that they are roots that stick straight out of the mud from the main roots underground. The roots take in oxygen and force air into porous tissue under the surface. Sometimes they look like knees that bend back down to the surface, and they look just like a bended knee. These are thought to add stability rather than getting oxygen to the plant, though. Another example of adventitious roots is shallow roots, or roots that exist entirely on the surface as opposed to underground. Now we can move on to another type of adaptation, not necessarily dealing with roots. This is a condition called hypertrophy. This term means an increase in the size of an organ without accommodating an increase in cells. An example is tree buttressing, also called, yep, butt swell. You'll see this in wetland plants when the tree trunk looks like it's swollen at the base. The purpose of this adaptation is to make bigger air spaces, allowing for more movement of gases within the trunk and roots. It also helps support the tree in wet, soggy soil. Another adaptation that deals with trunks of trees is multiple trunks. Trees will develop more than one trunk to ensure gas exchange and survival. Lastly, there's hypertrophy lenticles. These look like slits on the surface of plant parts, like roots and stems. They allow for more gas exchange between the plant and its environment. In summary, we talked about the physical adaptations that you'd see in wetland plants or hydrophytes. This wasn't an exhaustive list. There are many more that exist and some that may be morphing as we speak. 
These adaptations gave these plants the ability to survive in a substrate that is without oxygen and may not be solid and is very wet most of the time. I hope you enjoyed learning about these morphological, physical adaptations of wetland plants. I think it's amazing how nature takes care of obstacles that get in the way for survival. Well, that's it for the presentation. Have a great swampy day.